you saw some problems with her testimony the other day too. So how did you, what, what's jumped out at you? First thing is she might not have had to testify in the first place. When she walked in through the sheaf of uh, documents down on uh, opposing counsel's table, put hand on hip, walked up with attitude, doing steak charm thing with her neck. Um, at that point, the lawyers for the DA's office were arguing that she did not need to testify. She decided to override those lawyers. And one important aspect of this case is she was not on trial. She was merely being a witness at that point. And then she put herself into a position where you have the spectacle of the chief prosecuting officer for a major American city, Atlanta, needing to take the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> so, you know, uh, one of the things that's interesting is that she had given evidence that there was a tax lien on her home. Now, to clear those up, you have to deal with some affidavits and satisfy IRS that you should be placed on an enrollment payment plan, all right? Then she's talking about she's got 15000 in cash in the house. Then we have all of these cash transactions that should have been receipted and recorded. They weren't. You have the 501K she talked about she got out and she used that for campaign purposes, but that was taxable income once she removed it from the account. She didn't report that. So we've got a real live mess going on here in terms mm -hmm. of tax fraud, tax evasion, and that kind of thing. We've got a specter of money laundering here that raises itself. We have a number of issues that she brought out. Nobody had developed them before that actually ironically, put her under the spotlight that comes from the Georgia RICO statutes that, <laughs> statutes that she's proceeding against Mr. Trump under. So my, my, you get on the stand and you were prosecuting somebody and you blurt out stuff that under oath recorded everybody looking it makes you look like you need to be prosecuted for the same statute now mm. on the thing that people are getting sidetracked on well she had this affair it just happened you know they ran into each other on the job no she had this affair going before he got brought in as a special prosecutor well it really doesn't make any difference because if she was dealing with him before he got appointed, she should have approached the judge in camera and advised him of his or uh, her ethical conflict. And if it developed afterwards, as soon as it did, she should have walked in and talked to the judge in camera. And that means in his chambers confidentially about it and given him the option of saying, well, He's got to go because you're signing off on his claims for reimbursement. So you do have some say in what's going on. And because of what you said about your intentions toward Mr. Trump before the election even occurred, we needed an independent counsel. So this is bad. Now, if the court said, well, I think you can stay on, but we're going to have to reveal this to the other side. She might have had second thoughts and said, well, OK, we'll let it go. And some other DA's office can come in and go through all of the changes relative to this case. But I want to have it so badly. I'm just got my hooks in it. I'm not going to let it go. I don't tell. So either way. If it started before he got on as special prosecutor or it started after he was already on the affair I'm talking about, it's bad because she should have brought it to the court's attention. It's now, a very good point. I, let, let me just stop you there just, to, just, for, just to organize the thoughts for the audience. I, I'll take them in reverse order. 
that's a very good point about how she should have gone to this judge once the affair started by her own admission. You know, we have reason to believe it, it started long before she hired him. But let's say they're right that it happened in 2022 after she brought him on board. No question at that point, she was paying him well above what the other prosecutors were making that she had brought in. And she was certainly paying him well above what any prosecutor in her DA's office was making. So by any measure, more than people who worked as DA's under her were making. And she was enjoying the fruits of that labor. There's no question they were taking trips together. He was footing the bill. She now says she was reimbursing him, but there are no receipts. But your point is she had an obligation to go to the judge at that point and say, I've brought in this person. I am now in a romantic sexual relationship with this person who is getting paid above market versus my own DAs and versus the other two prosecutors who I've brought in. And it has the potential to look at least like a conflict of interest for me and judge it's up to you whether I should withdraw from this case or what should happen from this case. She had an obligation to bring it to the court's attention. All right, exactly. Nobody had to ask her. Under the canons of ethics, she had a need to come in and advise. Now, here's the other thing, too. She signs off on this, and you have to get a perspective for the exorbitant amount of money he was being compensated for. This case has not even been set for trial, but she already been paid roughly twice what the attorney general of the United States of America gets paid per year for handling all of the business of the country. He has been paid so far more than what the president of the United States gets paid per year. So keep that into context. You multiply, well, don't multiply, but if you add up all of what the other prosecutors have submitted as a bill, it isn't even a third of what he's been compensated so far. And this thing has not even had any hearings on it in essence that are of significance so we've got a potentially enormous bill that the state of georgia the county of fulton that means atlanta the people that live there are going to have to foot because look out of the same fund you have to pay other attorneys who've been appointed when there's a conflict and say the public defender's office cannot be appointed and see, you have to keep in context. She is not on trial at this point, though she might wind up in that condition. But this is a hearing to determine whether or not the Fulton County DA's office is removed from the case and another office is appointed. Now, the practical matter uh, that everybody in America is concerned with is is this going to go to trial or be set for trial before the election or after the election? If before, then you tie up a candidate who is the favored candidate for a lot of people in this country and you disrupt his ability to campaign, which is kind of uh, out there. Somebody, New York here, another New York, somebody, Florida, is trying to get into Oh, wow, we whoopee. I'm going to take over for the country and save it. And I'm going to take this guy out so the rest of them don't have to be tempted to vote for it, which is kind of crazy. One or two or three or five people try to override 640 million people. It's kind of strange. So mm -hmm. that's not right. But the other thing is, is if another district attorney's office gets involved, they may say same thing that happened with her. H-U-R, the special counsel for the U.S. attorney's office or the attorney general, and say, well, under the circumstances, we decline to prosecute. Now, you may not need a special prosecutor if you bring in another office. That would save a lot of money and expedite the matter. And I'm sure that entity would say, we need a time. We need a time to get up to speed. Sure, how long you need. So that's after the election. So for some reason, I saw one of the dumbest things I've ever seen a lawyer do, which is this person came in 
And instead of acting like you see CSI and all of this stuff that people have looked at for the last 50 years where the district attorney, uh, the staff is learned and efficient and the boss is really heavyweight. He knows how to or she knows how to get things done. It, she admonishes her staff about you've crossed the line. We have somebody that came across like maybe a high school graduate, no insult, down in the hood, sitting in a beauty salon, running her mouth off. And let me give you let me give you one sound good. bite that I saw you guys raise on your show that I saw you react to, and it, there was something off putting about it. She was asked, Fanny Willis, about the fact that, first of all, she had a $4,600 tax lien against her, and she was giving him allegedly all these cash reimbursements at the time this $4,600 tax lien is, is looming over her. So Ashley Merchant was asking her about it and um, asking, well, here's what happened. Here's, and you reacted to this on your show in SOT 5. Watch. You got a tax lien in 2022, $4,600. If you say I did. And you did not use this cash that you had to reimburse Mr. Wade to pay that off, correct? No. Right. I went shopping too when I didn't pay it all. I mean, it's basically a, you know, screw you. I'll do what I want with my money, no matter how in debt I am. Well, I had a former first cousin-in-law who was a chief IRS criminal investigator, and she said that she often had her staff watch these things to pick up clues <laughs> that they should investigate. So I'm sure somebody is listening, and somebody is feverishly trying to get a promotion, raise, or whatever it is. Look. This is what came. Oh, we got that. It too. Well, who's going to be on the team to investigate it? Now, I just happened to have a, I happened to have a friend, Wesley Snipes, and I participated in the proceedings against him. Oh. He got three years in a federal penitentiary, not for tax fraud, not for tax evasion. IRS testified that he'd overpaid his taxes by a quarter of a million dollars and had a refund check for him waiting there in court. Now, the interesting thing was, is what he did three years for is failure to file a complete set of returns. So this not only is not a com incomplete set of return filings, it is no filings at all. And she was in private practice, so I assume she had to deal with taxes at some point, and we have no documentation, no receding. We've got cash transactions that need to be reported. We've got problems here in that the state of Georgia demands a little bit more when it comes down to reporting how the taxpayer's money got used. So what did you do here? Discover a holistic wellness solution with Bond Charge, a brand dedicated to optimizing every aspect of your life. Grounded in science and inspired by nature, their evidence-based products cover a broad spectrum of premium wellness items. From enhancing sleep and performance to boosting energy, accelerating recovery, and balancing hormones, Bond Charge offers a diverse range of benefits. Consider the infrared sauna blanket from Bond Charge that they say can burn extra calories and detoxify. This innovative blanket elevates your heart rate, simulating the effects of physical exercise. Bond Charge says sweating during the process helps eliminate heavy metals and toxins from your body. Setting it up takes less than a minute and it rapidly heats up for a quick and convenient experience. For a limited time, save 15% by visiting bondcharge.com slash MK and use the coupon code MK. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E dot com slash MK and use that coupon, coupon code MK to save yourself 15% off your order. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.